has been in the news recently for all the wrong reasons. The allegation is that some of the best brands are in fact packed with sugar. And this is being done by some of the biggest companies. It's cloak and dagger stuff with fructose syrup being imported from China and being of a kind that, that can escape detection in the, in, the, in the normal tests that honey is put through. Why would this be happening? Is it just a bottom line issue? Or is it that the price of honey has become so low that to be competitive, people need to adulterate honey and not keep it as the pure, pure edible honey that we look forward to? To understand more, we spoke to Raj Silam, the chairman and founder of 24 Mantra an organic food company. Now Raj Selam runs a mighty good company which we track at civil society and they produce wild honey which has no fructose syrup or sugar in it. Apart from that, Raj also interacts with some 60,000 farmers, big and small across the country because this company doesn't just sell honey, it sells a range of products from tea to wheat to, uh, to uh, rice uh, to ready to cook traditional recipes. It's, it's a very interesting company. So we thought while talking to him about honey, we'd use the occasion to also quiz him a bit about the new farm laws and what the implications really are for companies like his and farmers whom he deals with. Today I want to talk to you about the, the controversy over sugar in honey. And uh, you know when you talk of the organic business then you're talking of uh, uh, you're talking of uh, wholesome things, right? And uh, we're talking of purity. And suddenly we seem to be in the middle of some kind of a cloak and dagger scenario of uh, <clears throat> fructose syrup, uh, which evades tests being imported from China and the customer being given lots of fructose syrup and the equivalent of sugar instead of honey. So what exactly is going on? Why do companies want to put sugar in honey? Um, yes, I think few of the things have been really uh, revealing to me also. Like I think this uh, non-detectable fructose special formulation. I knew adulteration was there, but I think uh, this kind of sophisticated thing it was a little bit news to me. Uh, I don't think any of the good companies, good brands, would deliberately do this. But the way the supply chain is organized it's prone to, I would say, a lot of mischief. Because if you look at the honey supply chain, uh, you have two sorts of honey. One is, which is wild honey, like in during our uh, course, in, in course of our life, we'd have seen some honeycombs on trees. And then someone uh, cuts it, and then uh, you kind of squeeze and then have honey. So that's what we call the typical wild collection. Obviously, uh, for a large scale, it has to happen in forests or those kind of undisturbed uh, areas. Mm -hmm. Then the second one is uh, what we call the box honey. Where Sorry, you have honey, you... Boxes and honey boxes, boxes. and uh, you have uh, uh, frames inside. They're typically nine to ten frames in a honey box. So that's the cultivated honey. Mm -hmm. right. So today, I think I would say wild honey... Uh, is very, very small percentage. Even the consumption has hugely increased. It's very small percentage. Mm -hmm. My sense would be it'd be like uh, 2 3 percent or whatever kind of thing, 2 3 or 4 percent. Mm -hmm. Balance is all farm honey. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, if you look at honeybees, uh, they forage, they, their primary food is pollen. Mm -hmm. And pollen happens only when plants are flowering. 
and obviously no plant flowers 365 days in a year if you have a small garden you will say that they flower sometimes <laughs> don't flower some other time and they are very and they are voracious eaters uh, yeah. so they need a lot of pollen so uh, obviously uh, so there is a seasonality to it mm. so there are three four two three uh, sources of contamination so the way as i said first let me explain so typically you have uh, in case of wild honey you have wild collectors so this could be tribals or local people who reside uh, in the forest or close to the forest to climb trees and then uh, do this and then they extract honey and then that's one set and in case of uh, uh, farm honey which is called apiaries so you have boxes so there are uh, bee keepers and each one either uh, let's say uh, let's say i am a uh, Uh, trader or whatever i will have some boxes i will give to some people or there could be farmers honey farmers who are doing this so what they do is wherever i think uh, they have uh, flowering crops so they take this boxes and keep it there uh, so these boxes already have honey bees they keep it there and then the honey bees uh, forage around that area one of the biggest uh, sources of honey is uh, Uh, mustard, okay, mm-hmm. sarsum, or what we call, it. because I think this is uh, over huge uh, swaths in particularly North India during winter, and this is one of the most productive seasons. So these people they take hundreds of bees and each of them and then keep it in the mustard fields, and the honey bees collect this pollen and then uh, they create honey in the boxes. Mm-hmm. So and then so these beekeepers what they do is they extract honey. and then they give it to the agent mm-hmm. because you need collection centers right this is spread across and these are very mobile particularly the uh, boxes the palm the mm-hmm. apiaries they are mobile so you give it to the trader and the trader could be given directly to a company or it could be given to a larger trader who in turn supplies to companies mm-hmm. so one contamination is people mixing fructose or uh, this kind of syrups or jaggery or sugar mm-hmm. solutions deliberately mm-hmm. to kind of uh, make more profit mm-hmm. so it could happen at the beekeeper level it could happen at the collection agent level mm-hmm. or it could happen the vendor who is finally consolidating and supplying mm-hmm. so that's one source of contamination the second source of contamination particularly in uh, this box honey or uh, the farm honey farm honey uh, is uh, because the bees uh, need pollen and you can't have uh, however much you are mobile you can't have crops 365 days of the year mm-hmm. so there will be typically summer months will be lean periods mm-hmm. so where there won't be uh, anything for the honey bees to feed and these bees uh, have to be fed so typically that's when they either uh, give sugar solution or today fructose uh, solution is cheaper so they feed the honey bees because so otherwise honey bees that's, like so that's fed to the honey bee that's fed to the honey that's fed to the honey bees to keep them alive because they need something to eat right mm-hmm. and are uh, these are all uh, are these all indian bees these are all indian bees that you have imported bees so typically typically what happens is that three three types so one okay let me say so this is one source of contamination mm-hmm. so obviously that was also passed off as honey mm-hmm. a lot of times mm-hmm. so you are giving sugar and it is uh, giving uh, sugar honey or whatever primarily it's again giving back sugar mm-hmm. the bees okay so that is a second source of contamination so typically when you come to bees you have three uh, 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 kinds of bees one is what we call apis uh, rana indica there are two native bees one is apis indica rana uh, uh, apis rana indica then the other one is uh, what is called uh, apis dorsata so these are the native bees they are more rugged they are more this thing But their productivity is also little lesser so typically when you do farming in this boxes mm-hmm. they use uh, this european bees italian bees they call for apis melliflora mm-hmm. so the this uh, the productivity of melliflora is much higher mm-hmm. but they are also like anything which is delicate much uh, much more susceptible to diseases okay that's where i think uh, to keep them alive because one of the biggest cause for uh, beekeepers is 
uh, uh, maintaining the colony. Mm. Because if the bees die, then his productivity is, uh, so he is out of business, right? So uh, when, when you talk, talk of Italian bees, now these are bees brought down from Italy or they're bred here or what is it? Yeah, they've been imported from Europe and then mm -hmm. uh, now I think uh, for uh, many years and then they are mm -hmm. So today I think the dominant is uh, Apis melliflora, which is the European bee. Because nine, as I said, 95% plus is the farm honey, uh, mm -hmm. the boxes honey. And that's, and there it's invariably only the Apis melliflora, the European honey bee. It's, 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 it's truly so productive. They also use a lot of antibiotics. Mm. Sorry? Uh, uh, so in the Sapis uh, melliflora, the yeah. boxed honey, honey, yeah. box, honey boxes, to keep them uh, away from being sick, they use antibiotics. Okay. Okay. So that's how antibiotic residues come into honey. Mm -hmm. mm. Otherwise, uh, there are a lot of uh, honeys can, honey bees can die. And to that extent, uh, 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 it will mean large losses for the beekeeper. Now, you know, all, all this could not be happening, Raj, without companies knowing that it's happening, you know, so, you know, would I be... I'm saying uh, not that people don't know. I'm sure companies know about it. Uh -huh. Only thing I'm saying, they may not be deliberately adding at least the good brands, okay, okay. or good brands or popular brands, whether good is a, a different thing, but uh, popular brands may not add on their own, but mm -hmm. I'm sure they're aware because today the honey prices at farm level have come down to 80 rupees. And 80 rupees, you can't deliver genuine honey. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? When you say 80 rupees, 80 rupees for what? For a kg of honey. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is the conventional farm honey. That mm -hmm. is the cost today, 80, 90 rupees. Well, now, why is that? Is honey a price sensitive thing? People don't want to buy honey so if I it's think, expensive. Uh, what happens is in the chain, someone would have started adulterating, so he's able to offer a higher, a lower price. Ah. Okay. So then, uh, so then uh, the other guy sees, boss, my price is higher. How do I compete? So I also mix. So for a period of time, the whole damn thing has become contaminated. Yeah. You know, so I think uh, <coughs> third, the source of contamination is primarily your pesticides. Um, it's not that pesticides are bad to the honeybees, mm. but they forage on these crops where pesticides are sprayed, and then automatically the pesticide is, and and the uh, uh, the pesticide also falls on the pollen, and when the honeybees eat the pollen, the residues come into honey. So this is a three, I would say, major uh, sources of contamination. The last two are still not got adequate uh, attention. Uh, today, I think the major attention is about uh, uh, adulteration with uh, fructose syrup and fructose uh, syrup and so on. Ha has the consumption of honey been rising? Has it been increasing? Yes. Honey has been increasing because definitely it is a uh, much uh, better sweetener compared to uh, sugar. So obviously, if you look at it, honey is uh, good. The next followed by jaggery, and last is uh, your typical white sugar. So, so the honey market has been increasing by what? Ten percent, five percent, twenty percent? Frankly, I think I don't have the figures because I've okay. not been tracking. But it's been growing rapidly. Okay. So if, if we have this fructose problem, uh, like most things in our lives, it is uh, driven by the, the quarterly bottom line. Uh, everybody needs to cash in. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, what does 24 Mantra do when you, when you go for wild honey, right? And uh, you're quite happy to do a, a small turnover. Uh, how do you ensure quality? And how do you how how do you assure your customers of quality? So wild honey is typically we do in forests. So currently, I think we have two sources. One is uh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh border along the Chambal uh, River Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one source. And second is uh, we do in Uttarakhand, primarily the Himalayan. So these are the two sources where uh, we collect uh, our wild honey. So obviously these bees are rapid low setup. So uh, so these are typically like uh, there's no cultivation there. The honey colonies get naturally formed, and then uh, we have these local people or tribals going and collecting it seasonally. So typically there are two major seasons for wild honey. Uh, one is I think uh, 
let's say after the rains september to november kind of thing mm-hmm. is one season then the second season is february to march so mm-hmm. typically these are two seasons so for us what is important is also that uh, honey is sustainably done mm-hmm. because a lot of times what happens is people just go and cut the comb and then crush it Mm-hmm. so typically in a uh, wild honey what happens is they take out the comb then yeah. they crush it with a in a uh, muslin cloth squeeze it and the mm-hmm. honey comes out so if you are not careful if people cut the entire honey comb it will also kill lot of larvae and small uh, honey bees which are developing mm-hmm. so then uh, one is it's not good and uh, second it is not sustainable so what we do is for us uh, it's very important that the honey is also sustainably collected so in our case what happens is we uh, work with these people so that they just cut only the comb where the honey is there and balance is left out so that means uh, the honey comb will again regrow so typically the collection during these periods happens at a 20 to 25 days interval in 20 to 25 days again honey forms Mm-hmm. so this is uh, just uh, people climb this trees whatever and then uh, and and, and who who for 24 mantra who connects with the community how do you do this because uh, i'm so sure that's a very is, uh, uh, we have still not gone to let's say directly collecting ourselves because the supply chain is very complex we work with two or three vendors and we do our uh, periodic audits every season okay. kind of thing to make sure that uh, they are following the one is sustainable practices and then there is absolutely no contamination okay. so this is how we do and in fact in our kind of wild honey the pollen count is very high if you look at fssa standards the pollen minimum count is 1000 in our case the count will be like 1 lakh less oh, wow. yeah so yeah. actually more pollen is better because It's otherwise better. what are you yeah. yeah. you're also getting honey is also fructose hmm <laughs> so no 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 fructose in 24 mantra honey i i can keep buying it and having it like i always do absolutely can, uh, 100% it's the only honey i have yeah. <laughs> you will find you. bottles a plenty few feet yeah. from where i'm sitting right now but <clears throat> has the profile of the consumer the organic food consumer organic product consumer been changing uh yes i think a uh, lot of times i think even when we started uh, of course our objective was to bring our organic food from the uh, drawing room to the dining table so that gets mainstream and when we started our first store in hyderabad we kept in banjara hills which is one of the rich areas etc thinking that perhaps only these people will buy <laughs> they are not sure yeah. and then we were presently surprised that there will be a lot of people coming on uh, old scooters uh, coming 20 kilometers away and happily buy but someone coming in a mercedes saying that why this one rupee more kind of thing Mm-hmm. so and then we have lot of instances where i think uh, a taxi driver a auto driver uh, they buy organic products may not be everything but a few things mm-hmm. and uh, so finally it is uh, so it's not so much about money but it is more about uh, i would say uh, certain consciousness mm-hmm. uh, and also an attitude towards mm-hmm. uh, eat health right food etc mm-hmm. so that's why i think uh, initially we were in major cities then without any effort we were actually able to get into about uh, now 240 or 250 towns and cities and then we mm. seem to be doing well without too much effort that's because primarily i think people want good food mm-hmm. yeah and they ready to food. pay pay a little extra you know typically uh, typically t- once they are convinced see i think the biggest question even there is also is it genuine and once they are consumed, uh, con- convinced about genuinity uh, cost is not such a major factor mm. but the, even even the price difference let's say the higher cost that you're paying for an organic product it's not like you're paying double is it yes it's about so, uh, 40% more but in rupee terms it translates into about 1500 2000 rupees for a family of four in a month mm-hmm. yeah so if i buy uh, the entire basket if it is a few products obviously it will be much less 
much less. Hmm. So it's, it doesn't really make such a difference in a family's budget, or it can if, if it's a very tight budget, but if there's some space in it, people might buy what they like to buy for the sake of quality and so on. I always keep saying that there's a cost of going to a movie in a multiplex. Yeah, that's true. Now, you know, from what I know, and I, what I know is as, as two ways, as a consumer and as a journalist, uh, as a consumer, I'm very happy with your products. Uh, and as a journalist, I keep asking around and so on and so forth. Uh, you have a very high retention level. You know, you have a, a loyalty to 24 Mantra, which is uh, quite extraordinary. Now, do you have to work very hard for that beyond just putting out a good product? What is there anything else that you need to do? I think uh, one is, I think each product, whether it is a wheat, rice, or a masoor dal, or a tor dal, mm. every product is unique. Mm. So that's been uh, my discovery in the 16 years. Every product is unique. Every product is very nuanced. Mm. Uh, so there are uh, a lot of small, small things. And unless you learn about it, and then on a daily basis, take care of that. Things can just go off track. And particularly in a country like India, where the farms are small, farmers are small. Uh, if you take your eyes off, then things can uh, just uh, quickly collapse. So one thing is uh, being on our toes always. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not that people are deliberately cheap, but I think uh, people want to be guided. Because ultimately, a small farmer, two acres, three acres... Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a pest, if there is no advice, immediate advice, then he will do whatever he has to save to make his livelihood. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think uh, we have to be uh, always there uh, for these farmers, mm -hmm. constantly monitoring the entire supply chain and seeing how we can make uh, these basic products also uh, better and better. So every time we keep learning. Uh, so even after 15 years, even for the basic products, we still keep learning. Do your customers apply you with a lot of feedback? Do you manage to get a lot of feedback out of your customers? Yes, I think uh, every day we have about uh, 15, uh, 20 emails or whatever uh, coming to us minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in India, but across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Either people uh, saying that, okay, this I didn't find good or a few people complimenting, or a lot of people actually asking us uh, doubts, questions, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is about organic, whether it is about health. After seeing this, what we did is we started a, uh, what we call typically a knowledge center within the company, staffed by nutritionists. So they keep uh, answering all these queries, mm -hmm. uh, both about health, nutrition, and also about organic. So uh, our customers are very engaged, and even a small difference, mm -hmm. then immediately we will come to know within uh, no time at all. Like mm -hmm. once, uh, typically what happens is in dal, typically they polish. Mm -hmm. So when they polish, they use uh, uh, either mineral oil and then they also add water to increase the weight. And then the color changes a little bit because of that. So once I think uh, by mistake, I think some water got added and the color changed. And I think within a week, we got so many mails saying that uh, there's something wrong with your dal, food dal. Mm. Mm. So immediately we went back and checked and <laughs> we knew that there's some mistake happened there. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, these are very special businesses to build. Not easy to build. Uh, one is uh, you're dealing with a fragile product, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, you know, you... It's, you can't douse it with pesticide. You can't do these things. Uh, you're... you're, you're dealing with a fa fragile uh, source as well. Uh, and you're dealing with uh, a customer who's fastidious, who you know, wants to pay more, but wants to get what they want, like the color of the dal has to be right. Uh, what have you had to do to build this organization? You, you built it bottom up. <clears throat> From the first brick upwards, you have built it. Uh, how have you, what have you had to do to make it different? See, I think uh, one is having a clear sense of mission. Then second is having a clear set of values. 
and being able to recruit the right people with the right attitude and then inculcate this both this mission and values in the people because uh, you can only do so much in terms of systems processes which we need to definitely have mm-hmm. but ultimately it is all those uh, uh, people in the field uh, mm-hmm. who make a difference mm-hmm. and if they are aligned to the mission uh, values that's the biggest asset you can have in fact there are also instances within the company where i think uh, where when mistakes were made even the junior most guy pointed out and said that there's a mistake here we have to correct mm-hmm. so so that is uh, one thing i think which has uh, really uh, put us in uh, good state mm-hmm. and second is uh, in terms of uh, doing small small innovations on a daily basis mm-hmm. so Uh, whether it could be like how to treat grains uh, for uh, to to make sure that they are free of any insects etc mm. to small things in processing so that it preserves the nutritional value but at the same time mm. uh, uh, becomes uh, palatable etc so all these kind of things or in terms of packaging uh, so that our shelf life uh, mm. is uh, good enough so one is the people uh, culture i would say mission culture values whatever second is this constant uh, innovation uh, mm-hmm. uh, so there's no big r&d kind of thing but this is on a daily basis going on which accumulates into something substantial over a period of time and third uh, i think uh, being honest uh, with ourselves if things go wrong accept that there's a mistake and then uh, Mm-hmm. correct it and move on it has happened with us in many cases it's not that uh, we have been perfect uh, whether customers pointing out or employees pointing out or business partners pointing out and then mm-hmm. some cases uh, because of this we have to incur huge loss but i think mm-hmm. uh, uh, we said that's fine uh, but uh, we don't want to compromise on the values like we had one instance of uh, basmati rice which we sourced from our farmers curry mm-hmm. and then it got processed in a third party unit and uh, for some reason uh, looks like it got contaminated with conventional paddy and mm-hmm. when we got to our uh, packing center we tested and we found residues so the entire thing we have to write off wow. so how, how many people does 24 mantra hire now you know it's some years since you started and uh, right now i think we have a strength of about 500 people plus or minus 5% uh, kind of thing so most of them are in the field uh, we have about almost 170 180 people who work with farmers mm. then uh, so what are their backgrounds uh, raj what are their backgrounds <clears throat> you know when they work with so farmers people, they... in the, people in the field are typically uh, mostly we recruit from uh, farming communities so okay. that they understand agriculture appreciate agriculture mm-hmm. most of them could be graduates or plus 12 but most of them would be graduates Mm-hmm. so that's the thing and then we take them on board and then uh, train them uh, then we have people uh, in operations so operations people are more like technically qualified either they are food technologists or they are uh, agri engineers uh, or engineers kind of thing engineering kind of background so that's in operations and then uh, we have in sales and marketing uh, because uh, there are a lot of people who stand in the stores and communicate our story to this thing so they are typically again plus 12 graduates whatever uh, so we have so many competency now one is uh, in terms of agriculture people with trained in agriculture second is uh, food processing then obviously third is uh, more like engineering skills for managing mm-hmm. the plants etc mm-hmm. and others you yourself come from a farm farming family right uh, if i'm not mistaken yeah. and interestingly you for a while you were selling pesticide if i'm not mistaken if i remember right uh so these transitions are all possible your family today is a different kind of farming family it's an entrepreneurial family and uh, it's still in farming uh that's so interesting given what's happening right now in the country now you work with some 60000 some humongous number of farmers in the country in one way or the other and most of them are small farmers and they're not they're not the big farmers and uh what is what is it that you can tell us about 
the aspirations of the small farmer in India? See, I think, uh, unfortunately, for a lot of farmers, it's still uh, a huge struggle to have roti, kapda, makan. Uh, mm. uh, so one is that basic struggle. Uh, obviously, things have improved in the last 10, 15 years. Mm. Uh, one is uh, not only with our farmers, but in general, uh, because the productivity has a little bit gone up. Then second is uh, prices are much better compared to what it was uh, like I tell you, when we started off 15 years back, the price of Hura would be about uh, 20, around 20 rupees. Mm. Today, the same thing is about 70 to 80 rupees. So obviously, things have uh, become better. But I think uh, apart from the basics, uh, the aspiration is uh, how do I give a good education to my children? Mm. So that's uh, one uh, important thing. Uh, uh, which uh, comes across. That's a big aspiration. People uh, want their children to uh, uh, have uh, social mobility primarily mm. through education. And if you talk to the women, uh, how do they improve the uh, health of their family? Mm -hmm. So either better nutrition or not getting exposed to contaminated things. Mm. Uh, so I think I would say these are the major higher level aspirations apart from having, uh, uh, let's say, a refrigerator or a mixi. In fact, mm. my village earlier, uh, no one would know mixi and the part where I come from, no one knew how to do idli dosa. But today in my village, every household has got a mixi, a refrigerator. Mm. And then all of them, they say they do dosa and idli because dosa and idli is more the coastal Andhra and uh, Tamil Nadu kind of thing, yeah. not so much yeah. in Tilangana, but they say yeah. now they do every week uh, dosa or idli in their families, otherwise the kids will not will mm. protest. Mm. So I think a lot of those changes have happened. So one is the basic aspiration, second is social mobility through education mm. primarily. Mm. Now, you know, <clears throat> the current debate is whether, whether farmers are empowered enough to deal with companies. Now I have you know, Mr. Company sitting in front of me right now and you're dealing all the time with farmers. Uh, what sense of responsibility does that place on you? Because let's face it, uh, uh, you know, you're, it's not one-to-one -one here. You know, you, you are much more empowered than the person you're doing business with. So sure. how, how much responsibility does it place on you to deal with this farmer? And in the course of how much time does it take for a farmer to actually start understanding market mechanisms and to deal with companies like yours or others? See, I think uh, the cornerstone of any relationship is trust. So whether you have an agreement or not, uh, that's not a major thing. But I think uh, trust is one is honoring whatever promises you make. Mm -hmm. And second, as far as the farmer is concerned, being fair fair uh, in terms of paying the right price. Uh, second is making sure that uh, he's not cheated in terms of being, etc. Or uh, saying that, okay, your quality is poor and then that's why I'll pay you lower. Mm -hmm. So these are the three things. Like I think they're saying uh, you can cheat uh, some people all the time, uh, all people sometimes, but not all people all times. And in case of farmer, if you do once, you're out. Okay. <laughs> right. So that way, I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, not only about us, but anyone. If they have to deal with farmer, they have to be honest. Otherwise, there's no long term play. You can do once and get away. And of course, people have done that. That's why I think a lot of times farmers are uh, cautious about it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have only one chance. Mm -hmm. And in that one chance, you make sure that you do the right things and the farmer is with you. And building this trust takes years. It doesn't yeah. happen overnight. So most of our projects we would have started with 10 farmers, 20 farmers. Today it's a few thousand farmers. Yeah. And that's taken whatever, 10 years, 15 years kind of thing. Because I think the farmer doesn't care about agreement. He cares about your word and uh, making sure that you walk the talk. Do you think the, <clears throat> the current laws which seek to reform equations in the countryside at the farm level, <clears throat> you know, open up markets for farmers and so on. Do you think they come bring too much too soon without adequate preparation for farmers to respond in this new equation? Uh, so if you actually look at the laws, uh, 
I don't think nothing will change immediately. Because what uh, uh, laws have said is one is the farmer has got no choice. Yeah. Because earlier you have to only take to the mandi, send to only a cartel kind of thing, a commission agency, it's a close thing, right? And most of the time, the Mondays, uh, a lot of times, it may, it's not fair. Though they talk about the auction system, the auction system doesn't work. So, so all they are given is a choice. It's not that suddenly there will be a lot of companies lining up overnight to buy this. Mm-hmm. It's going to take time. So it gives more choice. And, uh, uh, and no one can force a farmer to sell to someone. Today, what you are doing is you are forcing a farmer to only go to the Monday and sell, so you're given choice. Mm-hmm. So, frankly, I think what I think is more choice means always uh, better uh, deal for the farmer. In fact, if you look at southern states, about 60-70% of the procurement happens outside the Monday. Yeah. Unlike a Punjab, Haryana, who are primarily dependent on Monday. So, mm-hmm. I think that is one. And second, the farmer has never been part of any supply chain and has not seen the benefits of it. Mm-hmm. Primarily because of a draconian loss like the essential commodity side. So obviously, today I think for us, one of the biggest uh, hurdles is we are growing, the farmers are growing this organic thing and the farmer doesn't have the capacity to hold it for a long time. Mm-hmm. Few farmers have, or even if they do, they will hold some material, sell some material. So the Essential Commodity Act says that you can't store more than 100 tons, 200 tons, whatever. Mm. So for me, if I I have to buy this because I need Mm. a few thousand tons of each commodity uh, every year. And Mm. this is to be procured within three months. Mm. And uh, so we buy this, but at the same time, because of this law, we are at the mercy of uh, local officials. Anyone Mm. can come and say that you have violated the law and book again criminal case against me. Mm. So, okay, we have taken that risk and gone ahead uh, because uh, whatever we believe in and all that. But otherwise, no large company will do Mm -hmm. uh, because of this. So, obviously, they don't invest. Mm -hmm. So, removing this, because this uh, law was an era when there was severe shortages, coding was there. Today, I think that situation is not there. So that is a good thing which will free up uh, uh, companies in actually going out and procuring from farmers. Mm. And third thing is in terms of extension services, the government extension service, uh, which primarily advises on the technical in- inputs to farmers has completely collapsed. Mm. So this is where I think if companies enter this way, they can mm. start giving technical advice. Like we do a lot of uh, technical uh, and holding for the farmers to mm-hmm. improve their productivity, to improve the quality of the produce because the quality mm-hmm. of the produce is better, the price is better. Mm-hmm. So I think that uh, second thing will happen. And third, uh, infrastructure development will happen because I think today the infrastructure, the farm gate infrastructure is very pathetic, mm-hmm. leading to a lot of losses uh, and inefficiencies. And uh, that one lakh crore which the government announced, they seem to be serious. Had some mm. chat with some senior bureaucrats, and then they have started actually working on it. Mm. Where I think uh, people or farmer organizations, farmers or any small businessman can uh, borrow two crores without collateral at a three uh, percent uh, interest subvention, and then repay over seven years. So we ourselves are thinking of partnering with a lot of local entrepreneurs mm. to upgrade our farm gate infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Could also work with pharma groups. We'll be happy mm. to do that. Mm. So net net uh, is it's a positive thing. Having mm. said that, given that uh, uh, farming, most of the farmers are small. We also require mm. a safety net. Uh, so MSP is one way of creating a safety net. Second mm. is crop insurance. Mm. But frankly, as we go along in the wrong run, we have to find better ways of creating this safety net rather than MSP itself. It could always be one of the tools, but we need to increase this toolbox. Yeah, because it's a dampener for a for a competitive market. You can't have an MSP and a competitive market, and <laughs> so there's a there's obvious contradiction. And third is, I think today we are producing too much of rice and wheat. We don't require that. We can't we sell internationally. Mm-hmm. People don't eat that much, so we have to diversify cropping. So we have to see mm-hmm. how to incentivize farmers to yeah. grow multiple <laughs> crops. Like yeah. today, about 70% oil is imported. Mm-hmm. So how do we incentivize farmers to grow more oil seeds? Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, would you say, <clears throat> would you say that one of the things that we desperately need, uh, you know, we, we were once interviewing for our magazine some years ago, MS Swaminathan, and uh, he was at that time in, in the Rajya Sabha, and we were interviewing him here. And, you know, he said, look, I have this report, it's been lying for so long, uh, you know, we need to open up markets, we need to do all these things, etc, etc, etc. And it's uh, my report is gathering dust. And at that time, the Congress was in power. Mm -hmm. So that report gathered dust forever and ever. But he also said an interesting thing. He said, see, when we did the Green Revolution, we had a sense of mission a sense of purpose. We hit the fields. We, we went out to farmers. We worked with them, like as you're saying right now. You know, all the extension services which don't work right now actually worked at a, at a fever pitch at that time. That's true, yeah. So would you say that one of the things that you need along with such laws is you know, more imaginative regulation and more imaginative interaction with the farmer, which you know, does not seem to be there at all? Absolutely, I agree this. Uh, so it should be uh, communicated better, number one. And number two also is uh, how do we kind of empower them to uh, do more, many more things. I think that's another thing which is a little bit missing in this entire dialogue. So if that happens, uh, definitely I think uh, it will be helpful. And uh, like uh, you said, uh, the sense of mission for uh, attaining food security. Mm. Can we have that sense? How do we create that sense of mission in terms of uh, creating a diversity of crops so that uh, yes, right. we are less import dependent? And then uh, because of that, the farmers are uh, their own, uh, uh, I'd say, incomes improve. Financing farmers better. You know, <clears throat> we're so so bad at financing the small farmer. Right, the money never reaches them, or it's dole. But financing them in ways which empower them uh, is something we could possibly explore. Raj, thank you very much, uh, and uh, you know, I'm a great fan of yours. And <laughs> 24 mantras is perhaps the wrong guy to interview you, but I know, I I I really know what good stuff you do. And uh, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. We, uh, we will connect again and uh, keep reading Civil Society. Thanks, Sumesh. I think it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And whenever I talk to you, uh, you're pushing me to do, uh, do better and better because there's a huge responsibility <laughs> when I make uh, these you statements. Do. I already started <laughs> what, else can, what else we should do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Raj.